So tonight, I am pleased to welcome Norris Churchmailer. She joins us tonight to speak on her memoir, A Ticket to the Circus. With memoir, there is always the concern that there will be too little revealed, too much exposed, and all of it too sentimental. But it seems that Miss Mailer has achieved the perfect balance. The New York Times writes that if, during your long life of letters, you happen to run for mayor of New York, act in a film by Milos Foreman, consort with a convicted killer, insult Bella Abzug, headbutt Gore Vidal, sink your teeth into Rip Torn's ear, and stab one of your spouses with a penknife, odds are that there will be little left to say about you by the time your sixth wife comes along and writes her memoir. Yet, Norris Church Mailer's reminiscence, A Ticket to the cir Circus, still managed to add a fat new sheaf to the public, d public dossier on her late husband, Norman Mailer, and tells an involving coming-of-age coming story to boot. Ms. Mailer grew up in Arkansas and now lives in New York City. She was a model, artist, and novelist. Her previous works include Windchill Summer and Cheap, and Cheap Diamonds. We are thrilled to have her with us tonight, so will you please join me in welcoming Norris Church Mailer. Thank you guys for coming out tonight. This is, well, it's great to see everybody here. I hope you're all comfortable because I hope I mean, you're standing. I hope it's okay. Um, this, this book is not Norman's biography. Can, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? That's, <laughs> that's what Norman always used to do, a sound check. How about that? Is that good? People are always asking me about when Norman ran for mayor and, you know, those, all the stuff about the ex-wives. And I said, well, you're going to have to read a different book if you're going to read that because this is my book. This is my story. Um, I had a whole life before I met Norman. I was 26. I'd been, had a marriage and a child. I'd been a school teacher for three years. Um, I really wasn't thinking about Norman Mailer at all, except I've forgot to send back the card to the Book of the Month Club saying I didn't want the selection that month, and Marilyn showed up at my door. <laughs> and it was like 20 bucks. It's like 20 bucks for a book. I, uh, I, don't, I don't know, but I started looking at the pictures. The pictures were great, and then I started reading a little bit of it, and it was, you know, this didn't sound like some war novelist. This kind of sounded like a guy who was sweet and understood women and you know was just this terrific writer and so I uh, had an old friend at school who was a, a teacher named Francis Galton and then they'd been in the war together and got together every few years and Norman showed up to visit him and I heard he was in town through a series of flukes and I decided I wanted to get my book signed and I didn't think anything about romance oh my god I mean this guy was older than my dad I was a, a year older than my dad <laughs> I just, I want to be a writer too, and I thought, well, maybe we can have a little chat, and he'll give me some tips or something. I mean, I really wasn't thinking about much at all except getting this book signed, and um, uh, there's a very funny chapter about how the book does get signed, which I'm not going to read tonight, but um, the book did eventually get signed, and I wound up living with him in New York. We, we met, we, we used to argue about when we met. I think we met in April, and he thinks we met in March. But um, by June, I decided to move to New York and live with him. So, but, I, but I wanted to live on my own. I didn't want to live with him. I was independent. I was a woman's liberationist. I, you know, I can take care of myself. I had a three-year-old. I didn't get alimony or child support from my first husband. I was perfectly capable of taking care of myself. And... Um, got my own apartment, and I had $5,000. I ch cashed in my teacher retirement, and I sold my yellow Volkswagen, which I'm still sorry for. <laughs> Anybody who ever had one, I think, is sorry they sold it. Um, but I had this money in my pocket thinking, well, $5,000, I mean, that's enough to support me for a long time until I can get a job. And, but I didn't realize New York was an expensive city. And we'd been, I'd been here, I guess, couple, almost two years. I was trying to support myself as a model and not getting very far with that. And we were in that funny space where I really needed to ask him for money, but I was embarrassed to ask him for money, and I didn't. I hated to, and I was trying to make it on my own. And you know, I'd, he was very generous. He always was generous. But um, one of the things I didn't have was a warm coat. And um, so I'll read a little part about how I got my warm coat. 
The winter of 76, 77 was a particularly snowy one, and I didn't have a warm coat. I'd left all my coats, which weren't heavy, behind in Arkansas, and the winter before I'd made do with a black velvet coat with a fur collar I'd gotten in a vintage clothing store in the village on Bleecker Street for $25. While it was striking for evening, it wasn't warm. I'd also gotten a purple wool cape in Italy, which was dramatic but not warm enough for the deep cold. Then I ran across some old pictures of Carol, Norman's ex-wife, and Norman, and she was wearing a fur coat, a gray fox or whatever, and I got green-eyed fur lust. But how to broach the subject with Norman? I couldn't let him know how jealous of her I was, and I hated to ask him for money. He'd started having his secretary send me a check for $100 every week, which paid the rent and a few extras, but I wasn't making enough at modeling to really fill in the gaps. It was tricky. I couldn't ask him for a fur coat head on. But one night when we were out in a snowstorm, he put his arm around me and felt me shiver. Is that the warmest coat you have? He said. I said, yes, but maybe I could find a warmer one at a vintage store or something. (laughs) He took a look at the purple cape like he'd never seen it, which was entirely possible given his obliviousness to his environment. We have to get you something warmer than that. How much would a fur coat cost, I asked. Not that I'd need to have a fur coat, but they're really warm. Maybe I could get a second-hand one or something. I'll look around. Oh, I was so crafty. I saw the wheels begin turning in his head. It would never occur to him on his own to get me a fur coat. But once an idea got into his head, he did it up in a big way. He asked one of his friends, who knew someone whose uncle or cousin or whatever was a furrier in the garment district, and found we could get one wholesale. Norman said he would take me down there and just look and see what they had. No promises. I'd modeled in the Ben Con fur ads for the New York Times, and I knew a coat like those would be way beyond my wildest dreams. But I was sure we could find something reasonable for wholesale. The place was called Decor and was run by a guy named Buddy, His assistant was a woman named Rita, who wore too much eye makeup. But then, so did I, and we liked each other immediately. She started off showing us the cheaper furs, like rabbit and raccoon, none of which Norman liked at all. I tried on a mink, which he didn't like either. Too plain. Then he saw a coat across the room. What's that one, he said. We told Rita we didn't want one that was too expensive but the one he was looking at was a full-length red fox. Rita winked at me and went and pulled it off the hanger. I put it on, and it was like a slot machine in Las Vegas had gone off. With my red hair, it was perfect. Norman was so transparent. I could see him thinking of me wearing that coat and nothing else. (laughs) I could see it, too. I didn't dare hope he would go for it, so I didn't carry on too much. But after I tried on a few others, he said, Nope, that's the one we want. I'm not going to have you walk into a place in a drab, ugly coat. It has to be the fox. And he got it. I could hardly breathe. I was so excited. They were going to take a couple of days to embroider my initials, NC, into the coat's champagne-colored lining. And then it would all be mine. When I finally brought it home, the first thing I did was put it on with nothing else underneath. (laughs) Needless to say, it was a huge hit. He loved sweeping into places with me in that coat and tall high heels. There was a picture of us in Playboy at a party at Studio 54 with me wearing that coat when I was nearly nine months pregnant. There were pictures in all the social columns of me in that coat. I wore it everywhere. I hated to take it off. I had that coat for 30 years, and it was worth every penny he paid. I'm sure he would agree. Oh, P.S., One Christmas, when I was about 32, I had Robert Bellot shoot nude photographs of me in the coat, and I gave an album of them to Norman for a Christmas gift. He said it was the best present he'd ever received. They were classic Victorian sepia nudes, not pornographic by any means. I totally trusted Robert. He was my favorite photographer and a dear friend, and I told him that no one, no one 
else was to see these pictures, not even his assistant. He swore. Then one day, several months later, my downstairs neighbor, who was in advertising, called and asked if I knew if, that there were nude photographs of me being circulated in some photographer's book. <laughs> I called Robert, got quite loud, and reluctantly he promised to take them out. They're, they're, they're just too good not to let people see them, was his argument. You can't ask Picasso to put his work in the closet. He was frustrated. Still, I think he took the pictures out of his portfolio. Years and years went by, and we kept in touch. Robert left photography and opened a bed and breakfast in Florida called the Cypress. Recently, a remark dropped in a conversation with a mutual friend let me know that my nude pictures had graced the bar of the Cypress for many years. <laughs> Actually, at this point, I don't mind. It's kind of flattering being the nude girl above the bar. I told my daughter-in-law, Sasha, who's a gorgeous singer, that she should get some done while she's still young enough. When you're old and wrinkled, you will always have those pictures to remind you that once upon a time, you were a hot naked babe in a red fox coat. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one little picture in the book. But you have to buy the book to see it. <laughs> Okay, so that, that's not a very long selection. Do you want to talk and ask questions now, or do you want to hear some more? What, what do you want to do? You want to hear some more? Um, do you want to hear about when we met? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> it's been said that there are no coincidences in life. And I might just believe that. It was April 1975, and I'd been divorced for more than a year. Frankly, dating a lot of different guys had begun to lose its charm, but I had no interest in getting serious about anyone. I liked having my own house and doing as I pleased. No man to clutter up my, my closets, no man to clean up after, no man to tell me what to do, how to spend my money, what to cook. I was close to my parents who adored Matthew and were thrilled to babysit for me while I worked. My life was pretty great. Then I got a call from my friend Van Tyson, another teacher at Tech, who was having a film animation artist come and speak to his class. He wondered if I wanted to bring my senior class over to the college to sit in. I was always up for something new to do with the kids, so we went, and it was interesting. But the most interesting bit of information I got that day was that Norman Mailer was next door in Francis's class. And Francis and E.C. were giving him a cocktail party after school, to which I had not been invited. Although I've always loved literature, books were a luxury I treated myself too sparingly. But I'd been a member of the Book of the Month Club for several years, getting things such as Joseph Heller's Catch-22 or James Jones' The Merry Month of May. But for some reason, even though Fig knew him, I had never read one of Norman Mailer's books. Occasionally, I would forget to send in the book of the month response card saying I didn't want the selection that month. One such time was when Norman's Marilyn was offered. It was $20, more than I could afford. But there it was in my mail, and I couldn't resist opening it. After looking at the pictures and reading a few pages, I was hooked. She was our angel. The sweet angel of sex, and the sugar of sex came up from her like the resonance of sound in the clearest grain of a violin. Oh my, this didn't sound like a rowdy war novelist at all. It sounded like a man who was sensitive and understood women, and who could write like the angels themselves. I read some of the sentences over several times just to feel the words. Now, Norman Mailer was in Russellville. I called Francis and asked if I could stop by the party just for a few minutes to get my book signed, and he said no, that he didn't want to bother Norman with that fan crap. <laughs> Fig never minced words. One always knew exactly what he thought. Oh, come on, Francis, I said. Don't be like that. I'll leave it in the car. I won't bring it in if it doesn't seem right. I just want to meet him. I'd heard over and over from Francis what a genius Norman was, and I figured I'd never have another opportunity to meet a famous writer. I had aspirations to write myself. Maybe he could give me some tips or something. So reluctantly, Francis said I could come. 
Since they'd all been in the war, I knew Norman was as old as my father. In fact, he was a year older, just as Francis was. Not to mention that Norman had been married a bunch of times and had a lot of kids. The last thing on my mind was romance, I swear. I was just going to stay for a minute to see if he minded signing the book and maybe have a teensy little conversation with him. I didn't even bother to change. I was wearing bell-bottom hip-hugger jeans and a soft cotton voile shirt tied at the waist, showing a bit of my belly button. I was also wearing huge platform shoes called bear traps that made me about six feet one. I'm five feet ten in stocking feet. I was a little nervous when I walked in, realizing that everyone else was dressed up, and I wished I'd gone home and changed. And then I saw Norman. He was sitting in front of the window, his curly, silver-shot hair lit by the sun as though he had a halo. Saint Norman. (laughs) Amazingly, he was also wearing jeans, the most patched jeans I had ever seen in my life. There were patches on top of the patches. In fact, there were nothing but patches. His clear blue eyes lit up when he saw me. He had broad shoulders, a rather large head, presumably to hold all those brains, with ears that stuck out like Clark Gable's, and he was chesty but not fat, like a sturdy small horse. He didn't look old at all, nor the least bit fatherly. He stood straight away, came over to me, and to his surprise had to look up into my face. He always said he was 5'8", but I personally think he was a hair under that. And I towered over him in my platform shoes. I introduced myself, we shook hands, and then he turned on his heel and walked out of the room. I was a little taken aback, but I figured he must have a thing about tall women. So I just sighed and decided not to go out to the car and get the book. I knew everyone there, all the English faculty, the men dressed in coats and ties, the women in little dresses or suits with tidy bows on their blouses and sensible low heels. Someone handed me a glass of white wine and I started talking to Van. Then Francis came over and said, stay after the party and go out to Van and Jenny's for dinner with us. Jenny's making pizza, Van said. Why don't you come? Oh, thanks, guys, but I think that's a bad idea, I said. I don't think Mr. Mailer liked me very much. Liked you, Francis said in his gravelly voice, full of displeasure. Hell, he's the one who wants you to go, not me. (laughs) I didn't know why he was being so grumpy to me. If I hadn't known better, I would have thought he was jealous over Norman, that Francis was angry that Norman liked me and didn't want to share him or something. Anyhow, I didn't care. The fact that Norman wanted me to go with him was a nice surprise. The women teachers were all a Twitter because Norman had brought along another pair of jeans, just like the ones he was wearing, or even worse, which needed another patch, and they were all taking turns sewing on them. (laughs) So pleased to be able to say, I sewed Norman Mailer's pants. But there was no sign of the great man. I guessed he was still in the kitchen for whatever reason. I couldn't believe he was that shy. I went and sat on a low couch by myself, and finally Norman appeared. We looked at each other, and I smiled. I patted the seat beside me, and he came and sat down while the other women gave me the evil eye, looking at me as though I was the hussy I was. (laughs) I don't remember the conversation we had on that couch, something trivial, I'm sure. But I do remember the intensity of his blue eyes and his charisma, not unlike Bill Clinton's. He concentrated on me, that's for sure, and he radiated energy like a little steam heater. He couldn't sit still. Then, too soon, Francis came and got him so he could talk to the others, fearing I had trapped him long enough. After a while, people started to go, but I stayed put. Another teacher had just, who had just polished off her fourth glass of wine was determined to wait me out. We chit-chatted until everyone else had gone, and then, in an awkward silence, knowing she had to go, she grabbed me by the arm and started pulling me toward the door. Come on, she said. They need us to leave so they can go to dinner. I'm going with them, I said. Oh, no, you're not, she countered, pulling harder. Thank goodness I was bigger because she was determined to haul me out of there. E.C., bless her, stepped in and explained that I had been invited. So all the poor thing could do was sadly turn and leave on her own, weaving a little as she walked down the driveway. Norman and I piled into the back seat of the car with Francis and Easy and headed to Van and Jenny's house in the woods. 
As we drove, we were chatting, getting to know each other, and Norman asked me when my birthday was. January 31st, I said, 1949, which made me 26. He got all excited and started pounding on Fig's arm. Fig, Fig, when's my birthday? Well, Norman, don't you know? Fig drawled in a voice that indicated he thought Norman might have had one drink too many. It's January 31st. We have the same birthday. He was beside himself. It turned out that we'd also been born within one minute of each other. He at 7.04 and me at 7.05 a.m. I later checked it with his mother. A mother always remembers exactly when her child was born. He was also 52, precisely twice my age, the only time that phenomenon would occur in our lifetimes. <laughs> it seemed like some big portent had just been swooped in and dropped upon us by twittering birds. Van and Jenny's house was built over a brook, and as soon as we got there, Norman and I went out onto the porch to take a look. The woods, with the brook gurgling underneath our feet, were magical. It was so beautiful and peaceful. The air was sweet and fresh with the smell of pines, and dragonflies flitted under the little stone waterfalls in the brook like fairies. We were at first shy with each other, and I still had those monster shoes on, but it didn't seem to matter to Norman. He rather liked it that I was tall, and years later he would make me put on high heels if I tried to go out in flats. Put on your big shoes. I'm not going to have people towering over you, he would say. <laughs> the rest of the lucky dinner guests were milling around in the kitchen, which had a beautiful stone fireplace, watching us through the window, waiting for him to come in and talk to them. But Norman was in no hurry, and neither was I. I had wanted an intellectual man who would talk to me, and I finally got one. Norman could go on for hours on almost any subject, and this time it was one of my favorites me. <laughs> he rhapsodized about my eyes, my hair, my skin, my nose. Finally, it got to be a touch too much, even for me. I had to cut him off. Well, you really know how to deliver a good line, Mr. Mailer, I said with an exaggerated southern accent. But that's all right. I've always bought a good line well presented. He roared with laughter, hugged me, and told me how marvelous I was. I had the passing thought that with that one remark, I had perhaps made a not necessarily small impression on him. I did have to bring up the marriage thing, though. I wasn't going to get tangled up with a married man. Oh, little did I know just what a tangle I would find myself in. He presented himself as separated from his wife, which was technically true. And it was only later in the evening that I learned he was separated from his fourth wife, Beverly, but not quite separated from his present companion, Carol. And they had a daughter, Maggie, who had just turned four, six months older than Matthew. Since I thought I would never see him again anyhow, separated from a legal wife was good enough for a flirt, especially such an enjoyable one. Finally, someone tentatively came to the door and asked us if we wanted any pizza. There were only a couple of leathery cold pieces left by that time, so we went in and ate them, and he talked to the rest of the patient group. It got to be 9.30, and I told Van I had to leave to go pick up Matthew, who was at his father's house, by 10. My plan was for Van to drive me to Francis and Easy's. I would get my car, pick up Matthew, and go home. I'm sure by this time everyone wished me gone. I'd monopolized the guest of honor much too long for their taste especially Francis's. But Norman had other ideas. His plan was for him to drive me to Larry's, pick up Matthew, and come back to the party. <laughs> he drove, and I sat across the seat next to the door, not too close to him. We pulled into Larry's yard, and I went to the door to get Matthew, who was sound asleep. I carried him to the car, and Norman got out and took him, holding him while I drove, since he didn't know his way around those country roads in the dark. Watching him hold my sleeping boy touched me. We went back to Van and Jenny's, and I put Matthew to bed in the guest room. Someone there knew how to do Tai Chi, so we all did it. I was my usual clumsy self, which Norman thought was endearing. That night, it seemed I could do no wrong. Finally, we left. Matt still completely snozzed out. And Norman asked Fig and Easy if he could drop them off, borrow their car, and follow me home. I think at this point, they were both beginning to worry a bit about whom I'm not quite sure. But they had to say yes. 
I'd never before had a man over while Matthew was in the house. I put Matt to bed, and then we went to the living room, where I offered Norman a glass of Boone's Farm's finest apple wine. I think it was a bottle, but it might have been a box. I'm sure it appalled him, but I didn't know that then. We talked for another hour or more about my desire to write, my marriage, my divorce, and then he began to tell me about his life, his five wives and seven children. He told me how he hadn't lied to me when he said he separ was separated, but he was in a place where he was being pulled in a lot of different directions. He then told me about another woman, I'll call her Annette, with whom he had been having a serious affair for several years and who was pressuring him to leave Carol for her. He didn't want to live with Annette and, in fact, really wanted to break it off with her. But he didn't want to hurt her, so he'd suggested they not see each other for six months while he had time to think things through. He felt he was already half separated from Carol living two weeks in New York in an apartment in Brooklyn, which he used as a writing studio, seeing Annette and various other, other women, and then spending two weeks with Carol and Maggie in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. He had been continuously married or living with five women in succession, each waiting in the wings to take over from her predecessor since he was 20 years old, something else we had in common, our marriages at 20. It was all rather overwhelming, but I appreciated his honesty. I told him the last thing on my mind was getting married again after being with the same man since I was 16 years old. And so we understood each other. At least I thought we did. That this was just a pleasant evening, an interlude in his lecture tour, was the unspoken meaning of it all. He said I was the nicest woman he'd ever met, which I thought was just more of the line, but he might have meant it, at least a little. He said it a lot over the years, sometimes behind my back. And then he leaned over and kissed me. At first, just a casual, exploratory kiss. But the kiss ignited, and I knew I was going to make love with him. He was leaving the next day. I would never see him again. And I at least wanted to be able to say I'd done that, even if I hadn't been able to ask him to sign my book, which was still out in the car. <laughs> But I didn't want to go to the bedroom, too close to Matthew. I didn't want Matt to wake up and be scared by strange sounds or voices. So we did it on the living room floor. It was a bit of a comedy, actually. I was jumpy and nervous, trying not to make noise listening for Matthew to wake up. And it was awkward and uncomfortable. I wouldn't fully undress or allow him to, as Matthew might walk in. And I was getting rug burns on my back. Finally, it wasn't that great. How could it have been? But then there are a few great ones on the first try. Most guys never get near to great under any circumstance. <laughs> Afterward, I was sorry we'd done it, and I think he was too. It was a slight downer to a magical evening for both of us, but he held me sweetly, and I felt close to him. As he was getting ready to leave, I thought once more about asking him if he would sign my Maryland book. <laughs> but after what had just happened, I couldn't. It would have been tacky. I'm glad I waited. It wasn't until the next February, when I was living with him in New York, that he finally signed it. The inscription read, To Barbara, because I knew when I wrote this book that someone I had not yet met would read it and be with me. Hey, baby, do you know how I love Barbara Davis and Norris Church? Norman, February 76. Okay. I, I never really felt like he had an age. He was kind of ageless. He was always so young. He was always interested. Every day he woke up, it was a new world. It was something new going on. Um, he had more energy than I had, even at 26. We used to rock climb and go boating and skiing and do all these wonderful things. Um, so I really, I really never felt the age difference. But when he got older and you know, truly ill, it was, uh, it was hard times. But then it's hard times for anybody when they get old and ill. Well, he was never difficult to live with. I mean, he was, he was actually pretty easy to live with. He wasn't demanding. He, was, um, uh, he worked a lot. He, that's where I got get my idea of professionalism from him. He worked every day whether he felt like it or not. Um, you know, you've got to put your butt in the chair and write every day if you're going to get a book done, and he wrote every day of the week. Um, 
but it's you know it was it was harder with when he got older can't deny that I think that uh, just the town itself is just you you, you cross the line into Provincetown, and it's just this immediate, your heart swells. It's just such a beautiful place. The sunsets, the, the beach, the feeling, the, the friendliness of the people, the openness of the people there. Norman always said it was the freest town in America. It's like, you, you know, you can relax when you go there. You don't have to worry about a lot of things that you worry about in other places. But uh, I, I do miss it, but I do get back some. You know, this book was kind of a gift. Um, I never thought I was going to write this book. I just, uh, in fact, the, the opening little chapter of the book talks about how Norman used to say to me, you know, when you write about me, I want you to say blah, 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 whatever it was that he wanted me to say. And I'd say, I'm never going to write about you. Um, no, one, no one would believe it. And, but after he was gone, I just, I don't know, it was kind of, as I would go to sleep, it was like the life would start playing out like the mo like a movie, like reels in a movie. And I was a little afraid of writing a memoir, but when you write fiction, you can hide behind it. You know, you can always have your character do these things that maybe you did kind of, or you would have done if you could have, or whatever. But if it's, if it's nonfiction, it's you, and you have to take total responsibility for it. Um, so I was thinking about writing kind of a cheaper by the dozen kind of book because we had nine kids and we had these great family summers we'd go to Provincetown or Maine and you know we'd do all this stuff with them and um, I realized in pretty short order that I didn't have a cheaper by the dozen kind of life like <laughs> like people would think because we had you know six mothers and nine kids in the equation um, so it just started being my story and uh, and it just started reeling out and I, I really didn't if I needed to look up a date or something, sometimes I would, but um, I didn't really, I don't, you know, I wasn't a journal writer. I didn't have a lot of stuff to go back to. It mostly was just memories. And it just happened. I was very lucky with those kids. They were just great kids, and they liked me, and I liked them. I think by the time I came along, the oldest one uh, is a, a girl my age, and then some of the others are not that far away from me, and we played. We just had fun. We went shopping and we you know we did stuff together and uh, I wasn't trying to be their mother I wasn't trying to be their boss I wasn't you know I didn't have any agenda um, we just had a good time and I was so lucky to have them it's amazing because you know we had some pretty rough times and it's all been in the newspapers I say I don't have any skeletons in my closet they're all in the pages of the New York Post <laughs> so not you know a lot of this is not a secret to anybody um, but we had some tough times and we had some good times. And I think part of me wanted to relive the good times and part of me wanted to sort out the bad times and see if I could make any sense out of it. And I think that happened for me anyway. <laughs> well, he, I think he had some mixed feelings about Harvard. He loved Harvard uh, in many ways and, and you know, maybe had a, a, an issue or two with it. So you'd have, you'd have to ask him that. <laughs> Well, he he would say that, you know, he had nine kids, and on any one day, one of the kids might be the favorite, so he didn't ever pick out a favorite. Um, my own personal favorites, I think, are uh, Ancient Evenings and Oswald's Tale, which I love, and Executioner's Song. I think maybe those three are my, my favorite ones. I've read Ancient Evenings, I don't know, maybe seven or eight times, and every time I read it, it's something new. It takes you to a magical land, and I love to. I love novels where I can get lost in some new place. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. This has been so great. <laughs>